Scenes depicted in this video are of a sensitive and violent nature. As such, viewer discretion is advised. On a wet and windy April morning back in 1920, John Craft was driving through Turtle Lake, North Dakota. He noticed his neighbour's clothing hanging out on the washing line. As he watched the garments whipping in the wind, he figured, that's odd. What was strange to him wasn't the garments out in the dreary weather, it was the fact that the clothes were still out from the previous morning. What he would discover would haunt locals and later the entire country for over a century. Hi folks, I'm Johnny and welcome to The Oddest. Let's get a wee cup of tea at the ready and then we can start asking, who really killed the Wolf family? This case is eerily similar to the Hinterkaifeck murders, a video I did a few months back. I'll leave a wee link to that in the description. Way back in 1903, Jacob Wolfe, a 41-year-old farmer, left his home in southern Russia. His destination was the land of promise and opportunity. He was emigrating to America. He settled in North Dakota, a wee place there called Turtle Lake. His main reason for leaving Russia was of course to start a new life for himself, but also because he was just fed up of the whole anti-German propaganda that was tearing the country apart. Not long after his feet hit American soil, he would meet Beata Bossart. She was 35 years old and had also left Russia to live in the United States. Two years later, in 1905, the pair were married. The Wolves became renowned in Turtle Lake for running one of the most successful farmsteads in the area. By the time 1920 came around, the couple had six daughters. The oldest being 13-year-old Bertha, Maria was 10, Edna, who was 8, Lydia was 5, Martha was three, and lastly came baby Emma, who was just nine months old. They also employed a 13-year-old boy as a farmhand called Jake Hofer. He grew close to the family and was like a son to them. After the First World War, many Russians left their homeland and settled in the Dakotas. As such, there was a thriving community of immigrants. Everyone seemed to like and get along fine with the Wolf family. Well, almost everyone. In the first few months of 1920, a disagreement had taken place between Jacob Wolfe and his nearest neighbouring farmer, a man by the name of Henry Lair. Towards the end of the previous year, one of Lair's cows had managed to wander onto Wolfe's pastures. As a result, a couple of his farm dogs attacked the cow. This would happen from time to time, not the dogs attacking the cows, but every now and then one of Lair's cows would end up in Jacob Wolfe's land. This was simply because there were no boundary fences. I'm not sure why there were no fences. I mean, if it continued to happen and was any kind of inconvenience, it would make sense to build a fence. Now, Henry Lair was obviously angry about this and the arguments that would ensue over the following months would be down to Lair wanting some sort of compensation. Of course, Wolf wasn't about to pay him anything. After all, it was Lair's animal that had encroached onto his land. It was reported later that although they were having this wee disagreement, it wasn't nasty or anything like that, and by April of 1920, they were back on fairly good terms. It was Saturday, April 24th. John Craft and his wife were in the car heading over to the Wolf family farmstead. The day before, John had relayed to his wife that he had concerns about the wolves because he noticed the clothes were still out on the line, as well as Jacob's horses were still saddled. When John Craft and his wife pulled into the Wolf farmstead, still puzzled by the washing out on the line on this wet morning, they called out as they walked towards the main house. No one answered. Before reaching the house, Kraft's attention was diverted to the barn nearby. They could hear pigs grunting loudly. Kraft entered the lean-to portion of the barn. For those of us not familiar with this term, a lean-to is a section attached to the main barn and usually has a sloped roof, as you can see here. Once he was inside, he was frozen in place. He saw three bodies partially covered in dirt and hay. Jacob Wolfe was laying dead alongside two of his daughters, 10-year-old Maria, and eight-year-old Edna. As he stood silently in shock, he wondered about the rest of the Wolf family. They both then entered the main house via the kitchen and were quick to spot a trail of blood which led to a trapdoor of sorts. This trapdoor would lead to a cellar beneath the property. In the cellar, the horror continued. Mother Beata was the first body their eyes would fall upon. Next to her was 13-year-old Bertha, five-year-old Lydia, and three-year-old Martha. The fifth body to be discovered in the cellar was that of the 13-year-old farmhand, Jake Hofer. The almost catatonic trance-like state of craft, as his mind 
tried to comprehend what the hell was going on was suddenly broken by a sound coming from a small bedroom. It was the sound of a baby crying. The crafts quickly went into the room and found nine month old baby Emma still in her crib, albeit barely clothed, cold and hungry. Jacob Wolfe had injuries consistent with gunshots, two of them. He was found with a large gaping wound on his back several inches in diameter. Maria and Edna, the young girls in the barn beside their father, had suffered gunshot wounds to the back of their heads. In the cellar, Beata Wolfe had suffered a similar fate to that of her husband. She exhibited a large gunshot wound in her back. Bertha, the eldest daughter, had been shot in the face. Besides this, she was also showing injuries from an axe or a hatchet type weapon. Young Lydia met her demise in a similar fashion. She had been shot in the back of the head and sustained similar wounds like that of a hatchet. Three-year-old Martha was the only family member not to have been fatally shot. It seemed that she was beaten to death, possibly with the blunt side of the hatchet that was used. Farmhand Jake had been fatally shot in the neck. John Craft rushed to the phone within the Wolf home to call the police. However, the line was dead, only later to be discovered that the phone lines had been cut. Craft's wife scooped up baby Emma and they made haste to the neighbouring farm. There lived a young woman with her widowed father and her brother. A safe haven, for now, for the young infant. John Craft left his wife and baby Emma there and drove into town to the Washburn police station, where he told them of how he made the gruesome discoveries on the wolf farm that dreary April morning. Although it was 1920 North Dakota, most of the farmsteads actually had working telephones and working automobiles. The car of choice was the Model T Ford. The Washburn police had actually contacted the telephone operator for that area and instructed them to contact each household in the immediate vicinity. As there were no other means of quickly getting information like that circulated, it meant that they could make everyone aware of what's happened, but also warn people that there's potentially a killer on the loose. Pretty soon, various law enforcement officers were actively responding to this case. County sheriffs, town police officers, and even the chief of police, Chris Martinson, across in Bismarck, some 60 miles from Turtle Lake. Why would the chief of police way across in Bismarck be brought into a case in Turtle Lake? So we're going to deviate a little bit here to discuss something that I feel is very important to this story. And by the end of the video, you'll see why. Turtle Lake is a city within McLean County, North Dakota. Back in 1920, the county sheriff was a man named Ole Stifford. William Langer, who went by the name of Wild Bill, was the Attorney General and at the time of the murders, he was running for the Republican nomination for Governor of North Dakota. It would look really bad for him if such a horrible mass murder went unsolved. Politics, eh? Wild Bill Langer actually lived in Bismarck. He personally knew the Chief of Police, Chris Martinson, and so sequestered him onto the Wolf murder case. He wanted it solved, and solved quickly. We'll come back and revisit this later on. They were able to determine that the murders had taken place approximately 48 hours prior to discovery. This would put the time of deaths sometime on April the 22nd. Straight off the bat, there were a few things police discovered during the investigation that seemed odd and gave rise to more questions rather than providing answers. The phone lines being cut for a start. The initial reason for this was unclear. According to several newspapers that reported the case at the time, the bodies of Bertha and Jake Hofer were discovered wearing gloves. This is important because it could show that the teens had encountered the perpetrator not long after returning from farm duties and chores. It's believed that both Jake and Bertha were killed in the kitchen, only to be dragged down to the cellar after the fact. There were bloodstains on the walls of the cellar from cast off, which could indicate that the others were killed at that location. The police soon discovered the hatchet which had been used in the murders, as well as some bloody rags and overalls. The overalls were found in the kitchen. Although these overalls had belonged to Jacob Wolfe, it's believed that they were not actually worn at the time of the slayings, but rather grabbed after the fact and used in an attempt to mop up blood from the kitchen floor. The three members of the Wolfe family that were discovered in the barn, Jacob, the father, was believed to have been killed out in the yard and then dragged into the barn. Meanwhile, Maria and Edna's movements 
were able to be traced throughout the house. Their footprints led to a window where they stopped. It's believed that they escaped the scene and attempted to hide or at least made it as far as the barn before being discovered and subsequently killed. Not long into the investigation, a shotgun was retrieved from a nearby pond. At the time, this was believed to have been the same gun used in the murders. Authorities had the impossible task of trying to trace the owner of this weapon. They were able to confirm that it did not belong to any member of the Wolf family. That much they knew for sure. But after interviewing neighbours, no one recognised the gun. The investigation hit a dead end. Newspapers in the area had made comments and published information garnered from witness statements. A few of these reports claimed that gunshots were heard around 10am on the 22nd by one or more nearby neighbours, two days before the crafts made this gruesome discovery. Although hearing the occasional gunshot was fairly common in farming communities for various legitimate reasons, whether it was for pest control or even hunting, it was also said that Bertha Wolfe and Jake Hofer were seen out in one of the fields at around 11.30am that same morning. If all of these accounts are accurate and true, the police would be able to form a timeline of events. Remember at the start that I mentioned a kind of disagreement that Jacob Wolf had with Henry Lair regarding his dogs injuring one of Lair's cows? Well, once the investigators learned of this, they turned their attention to him. Henry Heinrich Lair was also a Russian immigrant to the area. He married his wife Lydia in 1912 and owned and ran a similar farmstead not too far away from the Wolf Farm. Lair was renowned for pretty much keeping himself to himself, although it's been noted that he assisted the other volunteer residents in the upkeep of the Wolf Farm following their untimely demise. It wasn't long before the rumours spread that Lair may have been responsible for these killings and these rumours soon reached Henry Lair himself. He was now fully aware that the cops were considering him a suspect. So basically, the family that ultimately ended up looking after baby Emma was the Hofers, now at the Wolves Farm to assist investigators. The locals were all about helping and all of that, so in the morning everyone had left the Wolf Farm to go over to the Hofers for breakfast, but the sheriff had said, look, Somebody has to stay here, so I'll stay. So this was early on the Sunday morning. After a short time, the sheriff needed to use the outhouse. Once he was inside the tiny cubicle, he heard a car door slam shut at the end of the road. Now, the police had set up barricades to make sure that anyone that wasn't supposed to be at the scene couldn't just drive down or wander in. These old outhouses had slats of wood and gaps that one could see through. So the sheriff, I assume still sitting on the potty, had a wee peek out of the slat to see who had gone out of the vehicle. He saw a local farmer, Henry Lair. He watched as Lair approached the main house and tried to enter, but the door was locked. Bearing in mind that there still there were bodies in the cellar, and also Lair had already been at the farm helping people out. Lair then turned round and began walking towards the barn, crossing in front of the outhouse. In a subsequent affidavit, the sheriff stated that he yelled from within the outhouse to Lair to ask him what he was doing there and said that Lair was visibly startled. As I said earlier, other local farmers had joined in the investigation, including Henry Lair. At one point, he and another farmer were tending to the chickens when Lair discovered empty shotgun shells, which he claims were placed neatly in amongst the chicken eggs. Police Chief Martinson and other investigators arrived at the conclusion that there must have been at least two people involved in these murders. This was because the murder weapon that had been found was a double barrel shotgun. In total, there were eight shots fired, two of which were fired at Jacob Wolfe. Each barrel contains a single shot, which can be fired independently of each other. However, once the two shots have been exhausted, the process of reloading the weapon is to break the shotgun in half manually remove both cartridges, reinsert two new shells, click the gun back into place. It was clear that this would be almost impossible to kill the entire family in this way, alone. Let's have a wee look at suspects. In 1920s North Dakota, a lot of the population were German-Russian immigrants. As such, they were a fairly close-knit community. Almost everyone knew each other's business. The reason that I say this is because roughly a quarter mile to the north of Wolves Farm was one of these neighbours, a widowed man that lived with his 26-year-old daughter and 18-year-old son. 
In the years prior to 1920, the girl of that household became close friends with Jacob's wife, Beata. Well, there was a story going around in the community that Jacob Wolfe was having an affair with this young woman. So naturally, her father was a suspect. This, however, was quickly ruled out. That really leaves only one other main suspect, Henry Lear. So these murders occurred on Thursday the 22nd of April. The Crafts discovered the bodies on Saturday the 24th, and on the Sunday, the place was crawling with police officials and volunteer investigators. On the Monday, Wild Bill Langer arrived at the farm and received updates from Chief of Police Martinson with regards to the apparent lack of motive, as well as theories of there being two perpetrators. Robbery was ruled out as a motive, and the parents' room was a cash box which had a fair amount of money inside, all untouched. Of course, one of Langer's first questions to the police chief was, where are we on the suspects? After a brief discussion on this, it was decided that they should go and formally speak to Henry Lear. However, at this time, he was not arrested for anything. The cops merely wanted to bring him in for questioning. After a short time spent in the company of the police, Lear was released back to his farm. On Wednesday the 28th of April, a funeral was held for the Wolfe family. The town of Turtle Lake, North Dakota had fewer than 400 citizens at the time, but more than 2,500 people appeared for the burial, where the eight coffins, both big and small, were lined up in a row. Late at night, on Tuesday the 11th of May, police would return to Henry Lair's farm and formally arrest him. He was put into the police car and transported 23 miles to Washburn Police Station. Travelling in the police vehicle along with Lair was the Sheriff, Ole Stefford, Police Chief, Chris Martinson, a Deputy Sheriff and a reporter. Now, here is a strange thing. Well, it's either strange, sneaky or genius, depending on where you fall in this case. But in a jam-packed Model T Ford police car, as they were driving to Washburn Police Station, they just happened to discover a vagrant bad man emerging from the bushes at the side of the road. The sheriff instantly decides that this must be an escaped convict. Well, the cops aren't going to let that fly. So they stop and they grab the guy and squeeze him into the car and continue on their way. Once they arrive at Washburn, both Lair and this bad man are put into adjacent cells. Not long after being placed in their respective cells, the bad man started speaking to Lair, saying things like, Hey, aren't you that murder guy that killed that family in Turtle Lake? To which Lair replied, no, I didn't kill anyone. The guy kept asking him all types of questions and repeatedly asked if he had done it, to which Lair continually denied. Then, at some point during the night, the bad man woke Lair up and told him that he had a way to break out of the jail and asked if he wanted in on the master plan. Lair again said, no thanks. He was innocent and didn't want to infer guilt, or indeed break the law by busting out of jail. Funnily enough, the bad man never bothered breaking out of jail either, and in the early hours of the morning he was removed from the cell. Strange. Yeah, he was a cop, pretending to be a bad man. Or is it the other way around? A cop that's a bad man or a bad cop shit, I don't know. So according to affidavits from professional witnesses, as well as Henry Lair's own sworn affidavit, he was taken from his cell around 8pm on Wednesday night and taken for interrogation. He was repeatedly beaten by police and was told that there was a large angry lynch mob outside waiting to kill him unless he confessed. He was told that the safest option for him would be to admit guilt and be taken to the state penitentiary, where, if he was innocent, as he claimed, once he was in the safety of the prison system, he could petition for a change of plea and opt for a jury trial. This went on for six hours, when eventually Henry Lair confessed to the murders. On Thursday the 22nd of April, Lair decided it was time to confront Jacob Wolfe with regards to his cow being injured. He wanted compensation, and that was that. The sheriff immediately called the state's attorney, as well as Wild Bill Langer, to inform them that they have their guilty man. Lair's confession was signed at 2am. Later that very same day, Bill Langer, the Attorney General, was nominated for Governor. He was swiftly brought in front of the judge. He was not offered any legal counsel and he stuck by his confession. He was immediately removed to the state penitentiary at Bismarck. As Lair was taken out of the back door of Washburn Police Station and placed into the car, they pulled out onto the empty street. 
There was no mob of people outside waiting for him. No one even knew that he had been taken in for questioning. It goes without saying that Lair's confession made no sense whatsoever. Why wait six months to confront Jacob Wolf again about the cattle dispute? Like I said earlier in the video, they seemed to be getting along fine on the lead up to the murders. According to Lair's confession, he had arrived at the Wolf Farm from the north of the property at around 11.30am. However, if he had come from the north, he would almost certainly have been spotted by several, if not at least one neighbour, out working the fields that morning. None of the community said during interviews that they had seen Lair heading to the Wolf Farm that day. The other discrepancy here was the time. If he had arrived at 11.30 like he said, then this would have been two hours after gunshots were heard by various neighbours. As we already know, Jacob Wolf's herding dogs were highly trained. Lair claimed to have walked onto the farm that morning without the dogs barking or alerting their owners to a trespasser. This seems very unlikely. Lair further made claims that he and Jacob had an altercation within the kitchen. Now, although things were a wee bit better and more amicable between them, they still weren't friends by any means. He simply wouldn't have invited Lair into his home for them to have this argument in the first place. Whilst in the kitchen, according to Henry Lair, they got into an argument and Jacob pulled out his double barrel shotgun. The pair wrestled for control of the gun, during which time it fired twice, killing Beata and Jacob. Well, the issue with that is, evidence clearly suggested that Beata was killed in the cellar and Jacob was shot twice. It was also alleged that Jacob had escaped and fled the house. As he was doing so, Leia reached into a dresser drawer, reloaded the firearm and as Wolf was running away, he fired a single shot into his back. Then, closed the distance between them, firing the second shot. There's so many things wrong with that statement. Lair suddenly developed psychic powers which told him ammunition was in a particular dresser drawer. Also, earlier on, we spoke about the procedure of reloading a double-barreled shotgun. Like I said before, I'm no expert in shotguns, but it just seems unlikely that this version of events are accurate. He then explained that he chased both Maria and Edna into the barn where he fatally shot them both with the remaining daughters left screaming in the farmhouse. He then claimed that he returned and killed the remaining girls in the kitchen before moving them into the cellar. Once again, the evidence does not support this. He then returned to the yard and moved Jacob's body into the barn alongside Maria and Edna, where he attempted to cover them up with hay and dirt. He also said that he was unaware that baby Emma was even in the house. Obviously his confession is full of holes and certainly does not match up with evidence or investigators theory that it was a two person job. Also, a glaringly obvious piece of evidence seemed to have been missed out completely. Doing all my research into this case, it was never mentioned again. The hatchet used in the murders. So are they trying to say that as well as using the shotgun, loading and unloading it between kills, that Henry Lair was also wielding a hatchet? Okay, so what about the phone lines? When were they cut? None of it made sense. Prior to his confession, just after his arrest, the police addressed the public with statements that would contradict Lair's confession. They said that Lair's state of mind was not stable and that the murders were not premeditated. Investigators' initial theory was that the murders were, in fact, premeditated. Phone lines. When he was questioned in late April by police to account for his whereabouts on the day of the murders, he had stated that he was ploughing his field at around 8am, which took around four hours until midday. He said that he saw someone ploughing the field belonging to Jacob Wolf between the hours of 10 and 11am. But due to the distance being around half a mile, he couldn't identify the person with any great certainty. He then said between midday and 3pm, he had lunch with his family and cleaned his barn. All of this was corroborated by his wife Lydia. He then returned to ploughing his field and eventually called it a day around 7pm. During the entire day, he often stopped to speak to other neighbours who were out ploughing their fields also. Joseph Mayer was one such neighbour who lived to the south of Henry Lair's property. He had stated that they had a discussion that morning in which Lair had expressed a need to drive into town to run errands, but he was reluctant to do so as his children were poorly. They then went on to have a lengthy discussion about the ongoing railroad strikes. Once again, this was all corroborated by his wife. Later on, Lair would talk about his confession and the police interview that he underwent. They cursed me. 
took my chair from me and made me stand still until I was dizzy. All this time I maintained I was innocent and knew nothing of these murders. Finally, the man I thought was a railroad detective beat me along the side of my head. He took me by the hair and pulled, after which he sat across the table from me and related to me exactly how the murder happened. He told me what I would have to say. He then stood up and shook a billy club in my face and told me if I did not say what he wanted me to say, that he would beat my brains out. I then gave up and started to cry. I told them I'd do and say what they wanted. Henry Lair was given a life sentence with hard labour. A short time later, he requested to speak to a judge in order to prove his innocence. His request was denied until November of 1920, when he retained legal counsel and a motion was filed with the court for Lair to rebuke his guilty plea and file a plea of not guilty, opting for a retrial. Did this happen? No. Request denied. When Henry was initially incarcerated, it took weeks for the doctor to carry out any examination, so his official report stated that there was no bruising save for some discoloration around his cheekbones, but of course any bruises from the beating that he received would have healed by then. However, one of the first people you meet when entering the state penitentiary back then was the prison barber, who said in his sworn affidavit that Henry looked totally beat up. In the first month of Lair's time in prison, his family were refused visitation, they were told that he was in no condition to receive visitors. Of course, the sheriff and his team denied laying a finger on Henry, instead claiming that he openly confessed of his own free will after being shown crime scene photos. Henry Lair would only spend five years in prison. On the 21st of March 1925, he passed away whilst in prison due to complications with appendicitis. He died as a guilty murderer. There's a lot to take in with this case. Things are never simple where politics are involved. Did Henry Lair kill 99% of the Wolf family? All over a dog injuring a cow, which by the way, sold for a handsome price after Lair was in prison. The injuries to the cow were superficial and as such, never really affected the price. Maybe Lair did commit this awful crime. Maybe he did so with an accomplice. The police in this case, as well as the politicians involved, should have been ashamed of themselves. Would they have been, do you think? Hell no! It was mishandled right from the start. Tens, if not hundreds of locals were in and around the property to help and show support, probably destroying all sorts of evidence. That, combined with the fact that the entire farm was quickly sold at auction, meant that any residual evidence was long gone. From the very start, they had their directive. Get it solved and get it solved quick. Whoever took the lives of the Wolf family also destroyed the lives of the Hofer family and the Lair family. Lydia and Henry's relationship didn't survive the strain of everything and they divorced three years prior to Henry's death. Lydia pretty much lost it. Couldn't even care for the children so she gave them up to an orphanage. It was reported that one of the Lair children was killed a short time later in a wagon accident. In later years, Blanche Lair, the remaining daughter, returned back to the family farm but lived a life of ridicule and anxiety as a result of everything going on. Although she ended up moving to Washington State where she married and had a wee family of her own. It doesn't take an ace detective to work out that the expedited arrest and coerced confession was all down to politics and big wild bills running for governor and I'll tell you something else, I'm sure you already know. This type of shit has been going on all over the place, right up till this very day. So what happened to baby Emma? She was taken care of for a short time by her aunt and uncle. Then, she was taken from them in a horrible legal battle. Ultimately though, she led a fairly good life. Emma graduated from Turtle Lake High School and attended a year of school at Minot State University, where she earned a teaching certificate. She taught for one year before marrying Clarence Hansen in 1940. The couple had three children, Priscilla, Curtis and Sheila. The young couple chose to stay in Turtle Lake to raise their family. So there we go. That's it for another video. Once again, if you've gotten this far, please know that I appreciate you. So go on and have a good one. Tell someone that you love them and remember above all else, keep smiling.